indeed. And uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you again for joining uh, with our Business Alliance presentation here this morning. Um, as we explore the impact on the UK economy of investment and hiring. We are joined in this presentation by Thames Valley Chamber esteemed members Page Group, Delight and Blake Morgan. I'm Adrian McMahon, Business Alliance Manager here at Thames Valley Chamber, and I'm delighted to be joined today with special guests, Dee Deba, Deba Pratham, if I could uh, get that out properly, uh, affectionately known as Debo, thankfully, who is Delight Senior Economist and co-author of the Delight Quarterly CFO Survey. Page Group Senior Managing Director Jonathan Firth, Kat Shimon, Chair of Blake Morgan, and our panel chair today is Page Group's Senior Operating Director Marcus Johnson, who will steer the panel conversation following Debo's CFO finding uh, or survey findings in just a few moments. I would like to extend a warm welcome to you, our delegates, to members of our Chamber Board and invited guests, including our Thames Valley Chamber President, Mr. Bill Gornell King. Welcome this morning. Our CEO sends his apologies due to other commitments, but does extend his thanks to each person for joining today's call. And we're in good company uh, here today, ladies and gentlemen, with representation drawn from many sectors of society right across the Thames Valley region. For colour, to name just a few, we've representatives from technology and telecoms, personnel, aviation, automotive, education, computing software, construction, manufacturing, utilities, software and legal. And it's a long, long list. Thank you again to all for joining. Today's feature presentation is part of a series with our member partners, and in looking to broaden and deepen our understanding of the world in which we all operate, we are grateful to our partners of today's presentation for lending their experience, thought leadership, time and insights, which hopefully will lead to better decision making and outcomes in your day to day decision making and positively impact your organisation as you navigate these choppy waters over this past while through the pandemic and now beyond. Should you wish to follow up with any of our future panelists, please do reach back to me after the presentation and I would be delighted to arrange a personal introduction. May I also signpost you to the chat box function. If you've got any live questions that come to mind during the presentation, please feel free and where possible we will group and bring those into the Q&A at the back end of the presentation. About our partner members today, Page Group is a British based global operations recruitment business. Headquartered in the UK, it's a constituent of the FTSE 250 index, 2020 revenues of 1.3 billion and 6,500 employees. It serves your people needs in all areas of personnel and recruitment. Delight is a multinational professional services network with offices in over 150 countries and territories around the world. 50 billion revenues in 2020, 334,000 employees worldwide. Blake Morgan is a large full service commercial law firm, six offices across the Thames Valley and southern half of the UK, employing circa 700 staff, including 530 lawyers who regularly feature in the legal, uh, top legal 500. And as so often said, without further ado, I'd like to extend a warm Thames Valley Chamber welcome to Debo to guide us through the most recent Delight CFO survey results. Debo, hello and good morning. Thanks, Adrian. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm going to take the next 10 minutes or so to give you a very, very brief overview of the findings from our latest CFO survey. Now, this is a survey of CFOs of very large British businesses. So we typically have FTSE 350 CFOs participate in the survey or CFOs of very large private companies. So this is very much a view from the top end of the corporate sector. Um, and the reason it's um, instructive is because they seem to be, well, they are the largest employers. They are um, also um, the largest constituents of the biggest um, indices in the country. Therefore, um, their decisions have an outsized impact on the economy of the, of the nation. So we look at these big businesses. We've been running the survey for about 14 years now. It started before the financial crisis. 
um, really came into its own during the financial crisis where it was the only survey that looked at large corporates access to credit. So it was a, a great use to the bank, um, Bank of England and the Treasury back then as they were trying to actually navigate um, through the credit crunch. Um, now, if we go on to my slides, um, I'll just very quickly see if the slides have been shared. I'm sorry. I... So, um, sorry, I don't know if the slides have been shared already. Um, Sarah, are the slides on screen for them? Thanks. Um, so if we just go to the slides, actually, these are the findings from the latest CFO survey. Um, it's the survey that we did in Q3. And that was a time when actually a lot of these businesses had seen a significant slowdown in, in demand largely driven by supply and labor shortages. And these disruptions started, you know, they showed up in their readings of uncertainty, their own expectations of when demand is likely to recover fully after the, um, after the, <clears throat> the pandemic for them. So on the chart to your left, you've got their readings of uncertainty and CFOs basically report higher levels of uncertainty in Q3. As you can see, uncertainty shot up during the pandemic. And then since then there was a gradual drop in it. And there's been the first rise after quite some time. And it is largely because of the supply disruptions that we've been seeing. As a result of it, actually, if you look at the chart to your right, they've also pushed back their expectations of a full recovery from the financial, a full recovery from the pandemic. So the, <clears throat> their expectations for the recovery of demand to pre-pandemic levels has been pushed back. 16% um, of them expected that in the end of this year, um, that's now down to 7%. And actually 43% uh, expected demand for recovery pre-pandemic levels in 2022 or later, that's risen to 52%. So we've seen this move um, from <clears throat> this move during the third quarter. If we go to the next slide, um, we shall see one of the big reasons for this, and that is the acute labor shortages that some of these businesses have experienced over that period. Um, chart here looks at you know what these businesses have experienced over the last three months and then what they expect to experience in one year's time. And as you can see, about three quarters of them experienced some significant or severe difficulties, recruitment difficulties or labor shortages over the last three months. And actually they expect limited improvement if you, if you add up the, the numbers for the expectations in a year's time, it's not fundamentally different from what they've seen over the last three years. So they expect these shortages to persist. Um, <clears throat> now I'm going to argue that actually despite this, actually if we go to the next slide, um, I'm going to argue that actually despite this, despite these expectations, um, there actually is spare capacity in the labor market. So if you look at the chart to your right, this looks at total hours worked. And even though unemployment remains low uh, by historical standards, um, as you can see, and, and we are in the midst of quite a rapid recovery, um, you can see that actually total hours worked is much well below the pre-pandemic levels in both the UK and the US. So it's a, it's a trend across the developed world where actually, despite labor shortages, there are significant, there is, there's a significant amount of spare capacity. Um, and we expect market fundamentals to normalize over the next year. Um, the reasons for that actually are that you have furloughed workers come back into the workforce. Um, health concerns are likely to also fade alongside the pandemic. So many people who perhaps are, you know, sort of unwilling to um, sort of uh, unwilling to sort of get back to the labor market because of health concerns will we'll get back and do that. Um, also participation, immigration to some degree actually, and supply of graduates should increase. Um, strong pay growth that we are seeing already should attract workers in sectors with shortages. Um, and also 
I'm going to talk about this in some detail later, higher capex or automation should lower the labor intensity of activity. So, um, you know, for the same amount of activity, we're probably likely to need less labor than we did before. Um, if we go to the next slide, actually, I want to talk about the other challenge that businesses have seen. And the story is same here. So they've seen significant levels of supply chain disruption, and they expect limited improvement in a year's time. And if we move on to the next slide, I once again argue that actually, <clears throat> actually, even though the impact that they have on this is that their operating costs have risen quite significantly. In fact, the their expectations for a rise in operating costs um, over the next year has hit its highest level on record. And they expect a dip in operating margins. Even then, I'm going to say that actually by the second half of next year, um, things should start easing. And the reasons for that are actually in the slide after this, which, um, which shows how businesses have responded to this crisis. So in the sense, how suppliers have responded. That is a chart which looks at container production in China. As you can see that there was a sharp drop in container production between 2018 and 2020. Um, as the recovery took hold, there were significant container shortages. And as you can see, production shot up in response. So there's, there's likely to be a supply response to this. There are a few other major reasons for which we expect these supply pressures and also the price pressures that businesses are seeing to decline or start to decline in the second half of next year. One, next year we're going to see a global slowdown. So growth is going to slow <clears throat> after this year's um, sort of you know, rapid levels of growth, especially in the West. Um, there's also very weak growth in China, or weak as in weak by Chinese standards. They're still growing at a, you know, at a faster pace than developed economies. But the gap between this year's and, and next year's growth figures for them is actually significant. Also, <clears throat> one of the reasons why we saw these supply shocks is because we really switched our entire consumption from a lot of consumer-based services in the West to durable goods so since we bought people bought sofas cars all of that sort of stuff um now we're going to see some of that resubstitution happen as economies stay open for longer we're going to start seeing consumers substitute services for goods so that's going to ease some of the pressure on the supply chains um also because of high inflation now there's a squeeze on real incomes and that will affect consumption over the next year so it should balance things a little bit. Um, supply chains are being bolstered, as I said. There's also fiscal and monetary tightening coming, um, and there should be some rise in unemployment in the West as you know governments across the uh, across the developed world essentially ease um, their support. So all of these reasons mean um, over next year, even though prices stay elevated, some of these supply pressures and price pressures should start to ease over the second half of next year. Um, and for businesses, that means a few things. And if we go on to the next few slides, I shall talk, talk through those. The first thing is, despite the fact um, that supply pressures, I think, might ease, um, that you know sort of that there's significant spare capacity in the labor market businesses have focused on capex after the pandemic and they're likely to do so this is a significant priority for businesses um, the primary reason for that being um, that they over the last 10 years or so um, especially after the financial crisis businesses have hoarded labor because labor was cheap and business investment um, has been pretty weak because they haven't needed to invest in technology. I think what we are seeing now as a result of the transformations brought about by the pandemic is significant change in terms of sort of how businesses think about their capital expenditure and their access to labor over the next 10 or 15 years. And what we are seeing is businesses switch quite significantly into capex especially capex into new technology so we asked um cfos this question 
um, that what are you going to invest more in in our Q2 survey? And the next chart should actually have their responses. Um, and you shall see if we move to the next chart. And you shall see that what they really want to invest in is uh, organizational and business process improvements, um, software, data, and IT. Um, they're reducing investment in research and development somewhat, um, reducing investment in training, um, design, marketing, brand build, building, machinery, equipment, also significant reductions in land, business buildings, and workspace infrastructure. Um, some of these themes have changed um, since we asked this question, but the one thing that is consistent in responses from CFOs is that the investment in organization and business process improvements, especially investment in technology, is going to be um, a key priority over the next three to five years for them. So if we move on to the other theme, actually, that is also driving business investment, um, perhaps not in as great a way, but still it is very significant, as you can see, in terms of the scale of change that businesses say they require, um, and that is climate. It's a key boardroom issue now, and interestingly, a majority of CFOs see it as a big opportunity for their business, despite the scale of change <clears throat> that is required, <clears throat> as you can see, more than two thirds see significant or wholesale change for their business over the next 10 years because of the transition to a low carbon economy. But at the same time, an overwhelming majority see it as an opportunity for their businesses. Um, and the real reason for that is actually on my final slide that I've got um, after this. And that is because you actually have response to climate and climate change increasingly become a business imperative. So it's not just because businesses have a conscience, but it is also increasingly, uh, you know, to protect revenue, also increasingly to compete better. So customers are seen as the biggest drivers of businesses' action on climate. Um, then you have public opinion and pressure groups. Then you've got investors. So businesses, CFOs think that actually raising money uh, will be much easier for them if they acted on climate. And then you've got employees. Actually, we, we were surprised. This is one of the biggest benefits CFOs rate from their action on climate change, that they can attract and retain top talent as a result of their action on climate. And then you've got policy, and then you've got com competitors. So the, the focus on climate has changed significantly, and that is going to also drive investment for businesses. Um, actually, at that point, I'll hand over to Marcus, um, who might have some questions for us or um, some um, points, Marcus, on this. Thank you, uh, Debo. Uh, thanks a lot for taking the time to present the latest quarterly uh, survey findings. We've heard a lot about some of the challenges, and actually you've also mentioned that there's some economic Optimism. So thank you very much for that. We'll uh, ask you a few more questions later on, if that's OK. Um, for now, uh, we'll move on to uh, Jonathan Firth, um, who will uh, reflect on, uh, on, your, on your survey, Senior Managing Director. Jonathan, over to you. Hi there, and uh, and thank you uh, for that, Debo. Uh, I think any insight at the moment um, is pretty invaluable as we sort of try to, to to plot the way forward in what's a pretty complicated market at the moment. Um, obviously, in the report of the top three risks seen by CFOs, which were labour shortage, pandemic, and inflation, I thought I'd try and put a little bit of colour and some thoughts around labour shortage. I'm pretty sure you don't want to hear my expert opinion on inflation. So uh, this is undoubtedly a legitimate risk. Um, the Recruitment and Employment Federation found that August was an all-time low on candidate availability. And therefore, to no surprise, they also found uh, that starting salaries rose by the most seen in 24 years during Q3. So this is a major issue, as pointed out. I suppose the question is, is this a pandemic issue that will ease as we come through that? Or is this a longer term uh, problem that we see? 
I was also interested by Debo pointing out that he believed there is spare capacity in the market. Uh, interestingly enough, I mean, visits to our own website has dropped by 14%. So supply obviously um, is damaged and our percentage of jobs placed has gone up. However, we're still not placing the same numbers of people we placed in 2019. So, you know, that would argue there is some spare capacity to it. I suppose our view is that everybody's looking for the same people and therefore there's a very tight market of those with experience and a lot of people being left at the sides. And that's an issue that, that needs to change. I suppose the thoughts on whether this is a pandemic issue uh, or a longer term problem, I mean, certainly it's been exacerbated by the pandemic, immigration being a big one for that. And there's 1.3 million non-UK workers have left the UK since 2019. A page, we have a team of people who solely focus on finding and bringing people from international markets to the UK and they are still on other duties as a pandemic stops people moving across. And we do see a bubble arriving of people waiting to come to the UK when they can. However, I don't think that's a major solution and we certainly feel that in the medium term the government really needs to have a look at the visa restrictions and the whole immigration policy uh, going forwards. So also there are other things like the furlough scheme. I think it's quoted 55% of staff furloughed either didn't return or left very quickly and that has increased vacancy numbers uh, on a short term basis. We also feel a lot of people in jobs are waiting and seeing uh, at the moment. Um, this is mainly around flexibility. Will companies really allow the flexibility they are now on a medium or long term basis? Or as you know, times get tougher, do they change their minds on that? Or the other side of it, actually, can people still keep their career going in the same way, working a lot of time at home? A perfect example we've seen of that is we've seen, you know, a massive uh, reduction in candidate flow from legal practice firms. CAF will be pleased to hear, um, partly because actually flexibility has really improved their working life. And therefore, a lot of people have decided to stay in practice rather than moving in house. The question is, does that flexibility stay? And so on, does that situation stay? And I think also shown by this survey, growth seems to be from organisations into new products and new markets. And obviously new products and new markets often needs knowledge and skills that are not available internally. So increasing the amount of employment uh, outside of that. For us to make matters work and what really didn't help was the introduction of the IR35 rules right at the beginning of the first uh, uh, lockdown because the complication around IR35 seems to have scared people off temporary hires. And we certainly know within uh, the accountancy side, a lot of departments used to run at about 10% of their department, their staff being temps to provide that flexibility. And that whole section of employability seems to have stopped um, and hasn't come back yet and is not being used, which obviously reduces the amount of people uh, available to fill roles. However, what we would say is that I don't think this is just a pandemic problem. In January 2020, Gartner claimed that during 2019, staff shortages escalated to become the top emerging risk facing organisations globally. Many will know in far back as in 1997, McKinsey's produced a report which first coined the phrase war for talent, in which they predicted by 2020, the world would have 40 million too few college educated um, workers. And lastly, the UK Local Government Association's recent research estimated that by 2024, there'll be more than 4 million too few high skilled workers to meet demand in the UK and six million too few low skilled. So I suppose it was of no surprise to see Debo talk in that report about uh, looking at different models, investing in technology to overcome this. My surprise was the reduction investment in training because surveys that we've seen show that most people's defense to this labor shortage uh, has been historically to invest in L&D um, um, for two reasons. One is people are hiring much more on potential. 
um, looking for people who long term fit the organization and therefore need to train them up to have the experience and knowledge that they would usually have hired. A lot more focus around DNI, bringing in people who they wouldn't usually have brought in before and tapping into those talent pools and often then needing the training side to bring them up to speed from the experienced people they would have, 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 have hired previously. And lastly, the sort of young and modern employee doesn't see why they cannot start in the accounts department move to the marketing department and then have a spell in engineering and they believe a good organization should train them for those moves and i think looking at the statistics going forwards and that labor shortage organizations do need to change their opinion around their employees and start moving them across departments in ways they wouldn't have done before and that obviously needs a lot more training. So that was a surprise. And I think certainly a change from pre-pandemic um, to post-pandemic. Um, uh, so um, I think uh, our, our conclusions on it is that uh, I think it fits with what we've seen before. I think also in the report, it talked about people's risk appetite uh, increasing considerably from the sort of post-Brexit world. And I think that uh, lack of risk appetite post Brexit referendum and the lack of investment coming into the UK created a sluggish recruitment market that rather hid this problem. So I think we're back to what it was always going to be and the pandemic has accelerated the problems rather than uh, created them and organisations need to look at this in a more long term way and have a strategy based on this being around uh, for quite some time. Thank you for your time and back to you, Marcus. Great, thank you, Jonathan, for your insights. And we'll, uh, we'll discuss those a bit more, I think, uh, a bit later on. But I'd like to uh, move now to uh, Kath Shibbing, uh, the chair at Blake Morgan. Well, Kath. Found thank you, Marcus. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I think the, uh, the report shows us uh, patchwork that we're currently working in. Um, certainly in my practice, um, Jonathan's absolutely right, um, recruitment remains a very, very challenging world. Um, and I think it's interesting to focus on how that has happened in the context of pandemic and Brexit and the extent to which the one relates to the other and how that might drive where we go in the future. Um, I have to say, uh, the, the impression I get is that a lot of the younger people coming in to the world of work have very, very different expectations um, from perhaps what we might have had even, even three years ago. And I think how the employee market now drives the way in which employers are going to look to employ, recruit, develop and train. I mean, like you, Jonathan, I was surprised to see that reduction in, in, in training investment because it does strike me um, as one of the ways, you know, we, we've seen it in the news with various industries looking at how they bring more people into training to fill job shortages. The investment in automation uh, raises a lot of interesting questions for me as a finance lawyer, in terms of where's the funding coming for that. Uh, quite a lot of it, I suspect, is sitting on balance sheets. Um, it will be money that hasn't been spent in the last few years that has been sitting there awaiting investment. It's interesting that businesses are choosing to invest in, in technology and in their own businesses and in organic growth rather than perhaps in investing in acquisitions and looking at where they might bolt on business. And I think, again, that's an interesting one from the point of view of how funding markets currently work, the extent to which private equity markets rely, for example, on, on people buying and selling businesses and how they might look to refocus their cash into businesses that want to do organic investment rather than perhaps the more... Um, traditional methods of acquisition and investor fundraisings. That of course then plays back into the question of how we all respond to environmental change and climate change. Uh, it's very timely that we're sitting discussing some of these things uh, in the midst of the COP26 discussions. It's not surprising that many businesses, almost all businesses in fact, are trying to work out how they align themselves with the push for, for, for net carbon zero, for keeping climate change to within the one and a half percent and whether or not that is even remotely possible now is, is a big question 
for me, I think one of the risks with the, the move to the net carbon, net zero carbon economy is the fact that I don't think this is a short term exercise. Um, there are some quick wins and I'm sure, you know, all businesses are looking very closely at their their day to day energy consumption, how they change their impact on the environment, um, you know, whether or not you, how much paper you use. Uh, lots of people are resizing office space to use it more efficiently. And that's not just because of the move towards more flexible working. But it's also because a better and more efficient workspace is clearly more cost effective and more climate friendly. The challenge, I think, for a lot of businesses, what do you do when you've done all the easy things? You know, you, you, you've changed your lighting, you've, um, you've perhaps, you know, you, you've resized your business, you've insulated, you've done all of those things. And you're then looking at what are the long term changes that you need to drive, not just in your actual processes, but actually in the whole way that you operate, how you face the economy, both in terms of your supply chain and demands you place on those supplying you. Um, and depending on where you sit in that supply chain, of course, that creates a whole set of different questions. And also then, of course, how you face your own customer base and how you not only respond to their demands, but perhaps help to shape their demands in the ways that are going to be A, feasible and B, effective for you. If you then sit all of that alongside um, the expected inflation increases over the next nine to 12 months. And Deba, I'm conscious of your comments there and it'll be interesting to see to what extent this all flows through in, in the way in which you've uh, anticipated. I think, you know, for, for business uh, looking at this, that there's, a, there's quite a long game that has to be planned out in terms of how you flow those changes through, where you make the changes and at what point, and then obviously how you fund those things in a sustainable fashion in order to be able to remain competitive in your marketplace. Um, I think that's probably enough from me. I think that the interesting thing about all of this is not many of these challenges at this stage are legal. Um, a lot of the challenges are around how businesses are going to completely reshape themselves to face all of these different pressures all at the same time. So I'll, I'll pause there, Marcus, and hand back, and no doubt um, there'll be lots to discuss later. Yes, thanks, thanks, Kath. I, I think, yes, we will unpick some of this in the next sort of 25 minutes if we can. So uh, just the linking, I suppose, from your comments, Kath, around inflation. I suppose the first question should go to Debo. Uh, and the first discussion point, I think, is uh, challenges around labour shortages, supply chain, um, and demand on raw materials will make growth much more expensive um, and difficult. What, what is the, why is it the main priority despite the, these headwinds, Debo? So one of the, um, the key reasons is um, the, the issue that I pointed out, which is after the financial crisis, businesses actually benefited from a, an extended period of access to very cheap labor. And as a result, businesses hoarded labor um, instead of investing in technology. So what you saw is in certain sectors, you had market leaders that actually made investments in technology and were actually more productive. Um, and then behind them, there was a long tail of kind of productivity laggards um, <clears throat> that could manage with their access to labor. Now, um, both with the introduction of the national living wage um, and also <clears throat> sort of more difficult or as a sort of greater friction in terms of accessing um, especially um, cheap labor. Um, I think a lot of businesses are having to face um, a specific of a new reality where you know you actually are forced to make those investments, which could be a good thing actually in the long term because the UK has seen pretty weak productivity growth since the financial crisis. If this boosts productivity um, in the long run, that would actually improve living standards. The other point I'd make um, in terms of investments is that a change or an economic shock like the pandemic you know, sort of has, it changes the business models of many, many companies. And one of the things that many businesses have realized over this period is that they simply hadn't investment, invested enough 
in software and IT um, over the last few years. And so they are basically catching up with what they would have done. There's also a little bit of catch up in terms of the investment lost last year, which they would have planned for earlier. So they're gonna do that too. Great, thank you, uh, Debo. Um, Jonathan, I suppose over to you. Uh, if there is an ongoing labor shortage, do we see an increase in potential offshoring? Uh, I think not really, because it's a global problem. Um, so offshoring doesn't solve the skills problem. And actually, if you look at where skills are based, often the places where people will offshore from a cost point of view actually have bigger shortages of the skills required than we do in Western markets. So I think uh, there are two sides to this. I think offshoring is about cost and that will continue as people look to make savings. Then the other way, there is going to be a fight really to import the skills wherever they are globally into your country. And I suppose our fear is that in the coming years, the sort of UK government position is going to reduce our competitiveness against other countries uh, in, in being able to attract and bring those people in. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, and Kath, you mentioned inflation. I thought I'd just take it a bit further. From what you're seeing, how prepared are businesses for this likely increase in interest rates and inflation and sort of how can we prepare better? It's one of those perennial questions, isn't it? That um, you almost, you can't prepare, but you must. Um, I think, you know, uh, one of the things that's coming back around in, in a lot of the transactions I'm seeing is more efficient use of hedging products. And to a degree, those, those again, you know, after the, of the original financial crisis there was a lot of focus on whether or not hedging was the way to go and how that works and the extent to which it has been missold. I think this process will bring it back into focus in particularly in the mid-markets where increasingly more recently it's coming back having gone almost completely out of fashion people are starting to look at it again. Um, I think people are also looking at it in in terms of currency movement um, obviously, you know, with us becoming more detached from Europe in some ways and having more fluid currency movements, perhaps against other currencies, uh, one of the things you can do is you can look at how you manage your, your cost base against the inflation rates in other, in other jurisdictions. Yeah. Um, that's, that's perhaps a bit more radical. And for a lot of businesses that have principally a UK focus, perhaps that's less, less uh, appropriate. Um, I think the other thing is, is just, you know, there is still good availability of funding out there. And you know, notwithstanding the movements in uh, in the base rate, uh, it's still you know at a, you know if you look back, it's still at a very low level compared to where it was, you know, ten or fifteen years ago. Even um, the other thing that's going to be interesting, of course, is to see how the interest rate changes moving away from LIBOR into the uh, into the Sonia and other historically based interest rates will work in terms of reducing volatil volatility in margins. Um, which although that doesn't change the base cost of lending does mean that what, what it might do overall is, is smooth that curve for some people. So I think you know that for businesses looking now at the possibility of whether they're moving uh, perhaps out of financing on a, on a LIBOR basis and whether they go for base rate or a Sonia or a historic an overnight rate, don't be too scared of the overnight rate because actually they may have quite a useful smoothing effect going forward. Great. Thanks, Kat. Really, really good answer. Thanks for that. And Debo, uh, did you want to add to that? Uh, uh, anything around the inflation and how business can prepare? Actually, just a, just a couple of points. Um, one of the points, not on inflation, but on um, labour market and, uh, you know, uh, spec capacity and um, the kind of shortages that people are seeing. Um, really one of the ways of looking at spare capacity um, or at least the way that we look at it is we look at vacancies and we look at unemployment and we look at the rate at which vacancies are rising and the rate at which unemployment is rising and if the gap between the two is large then you're seeing a significant tightening of the labor market funnily enough if you look at vacancies over unemployment for specific sectors um, actually levels are similar to where they were just before the pandemic. Um, so if you look at say transport and storage, um, the levels are kind of similar, despite the acute shortage of AGV drivers, 
levels are similar for the the overall sector. Um, and then, I mean, obviously, part of it is because HGV drivers only account for 15% of employment in that sector. So there's a lot more in that sector than just that. Um, and the overall sort of, you know, the figures do not suggest the kind of tightness that some of the stories would make us believe. So I think that is one, one element. Um, and on inflation, I think the, the other point that I would add is... Um, there is a you know, supply response, as I showed in the charts. Um, last year, um, we had this massive, massive shortage of hand sanitizer as we entered into the pandemic. And then within five months, I think it was um, Unilever, whose CEO um, announced um, in their annual report that it actually boosted hand sanitizer production 600 times in five months. Uh, it's, it's amazing the kind of supply response that you can see, similar to the, the chart that I showed of the you know, sort of container production and other things. So some of these things should start easing. Um, you know, also, as I said, we're not going to continuously buy new sofas and that sort of stuff. So uh, demand should ease too somewhat. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. And Jonathan, uh, you talked about untapped talent and talent pools in relation to DNI. Can you expand on this? Yes, absolutely. Um, I suppose probably the best way is to give you an example uh, from this year. Uh, so we've recently uh, placed a young man. Uh, he was at Bristol University. Um, he wanted to be an accountant, very bright, uh, when unfortunately he had a terrible car accident, uh, which paralyzed him from the neck down. Uh, obviously, after a long spell in hospital, he then came out and sat unable to get a job for five years. Um, because he just couldn't enter the job market. Now, every company has wheelchair access these days. Obviously, he has uh, his own technology that he can set up that, with laptops and stuff. And so now he's been able to, to get a job. Um, because I think companies have begun to open their doors uh, to people like that and not just see it as a problem. He's extremely bright um, and I think will be a very loyal employee. And particularly around disability, um, there's a very, very large pool of people who I think technology has now helped to access up, but there is still a fear to overcome. And I think often people hire people very much like they've hired before. Uh, there's a, a law firm who's particularly focused on university um, with large ethnic minorities and they're finding they're getting a very different employee and they're finding they're getting employees had to work to uh, get themselves through university. So maybe we're a bit more streetwise and a bit more mature than people they've brought in. So it, it's there are untapped pools, but also there are wider pools than just looking at maybe what people have seen before. So that, that's what we mean by that. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, yes, yes, really important, really good examples um, there as well. And Debo, I just wanted to talk to you about delivering social value. Uh, you've talked about that in the report as well. Uh, it's becoming more and more important for business, a society and customers are demanding it and making purchases around this. How much are CFOs plans and investments around climate change, a commercial decision to adapt to customer needs rather than uh, social conscience? Well, I think that that was the big finding from the survey, that it, it is as much a business um, and a commercial imperative as it is, um, you know, doing the right thing and as it is a kind of social response. Um, I think what we've seen certainly over the last two years or so, um, you know, so this, this is something which has been accelerated by the pandemic, but not really created by the pandemic. It was already in motion. We were seeing climate pop up in our conversations with senior management and clients increasingly over that period. And it was initially started off as, you know, something which was a key factor that investors were looking at. Um, then increasingly, it was something which employees were looking at. And during the pandemic, what has happened is as people have focused on public health, and on the environment. It has become something which the whole world is looking at. And I think for businesses, that, that means they're operating in a world where revenues, access to funding, access to talent, all of these things will depend to quite an extent on, you know, not just whether they have a social conscience, but actually whether they show that they've got a plan towards 
sort of moving to net zero for their own businesses. Um, and we see that as a priority actually <clears throat> for, for a lot of, a lot of the, um, the, the biggest British businesses that we talk to. Great, thanks for that uh, insight, Debo. And, and Kath, over to you again. Um, in reference to organic growth being a key focus of CFOs in the report, in contrast to reduced focus on growth by acquisition, interestingly, what do you think is driving the change? Uh, risk appetite, to, to, to a degree. I think that um, there's an element around uh, best use of the cash on your balance sheet at any given moment is, is in, in a set of activities that perhaps you can align more closely to your own business. I think there's, there's an element of risk appetite there. I think there's also an element um, that actually, if you look out, if you look around, many because so many businesses are facing the same challenges, you're not necessarily seeing the, uh, the, the obvious benefits of doing an acquisition over and above investing in new technology. Because, mm. you know, if all businesses are equally behind, then, then your best, you know, your best way of getting ahead is going to be to invest in, in, in the new technology, in, in the acquisition of the future wherewithal to deliver in that way, rather than perhaps in just focusing on expanding maybe, um, you know, your, your size or your coverage. So I think that's, that's a big part of it. Um, I do think that uh, it's interesting how it plays into the, um, the social governance, you know, environmental social governance piece in terms of making sure that what you do is absolutely aligned with the, uh, with the needs and the requirements of, of, of your environment, uh, you know, specifically suppliers, customers, employees. And maybe again, what we're seeing there is, is, is a bigger appetite to invest in green technology. There's certainly a bigger appetite to fund it. So, you know, if you're looking for investment money at the moment, whether that is from, you know, investors or lenders, um, we will be aware that there are huge programs out there for spending money on green development. Therefore, you know, you, you can see very easily that it very quickly becomes quite, you know, more cost effective to invest your money in, 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 in a new technology than perhaps it does in, in buying and onboarding another business. Yeah, makes absolute sense. Um, and Jonathan, organisations worry that hiring on potential uh, and training up is just spending money to make people more marketable, um, who, who they then lose. Um, is, that, is that a legitimate danger? Yeah, I think, of course, it's always a danger that, um, you know, uh, firms that are the most successful will be getting the most calls to, to their staff. But I don't think that should stop people. And I think it's interesting talking to organisations at the moment who seem to be investing very heavily for obvious reasons in recruitment and looking at how they recruit and what they recruit and all of that sort of side. But you hear very little about investment in retention. And I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people view employees these days of being disloyal and therefore, you know, they'll go anyway. And, and I, I don't think that's right. You know, every survey that's come out has shown that culture and experience come before salary. You know, and if you create the right culture and the right experience for people, they will stay in the firm. And, you know, you can create the career that they want, which is slightly different slightly different to others so of course it's going to be a risk but if you focus on retention you will keep on average people for longer and I think that's probably more uh, a better way of arming yourselves uh, for this labour shortage which is going to continue than just increasing your investment in the fight constantly against other people to get those skills in the door. Great thanks Jonathan. Um, and Deba, I thought I'd uh, mention Brexit at least once um, in, in, in this webinar. Um, but completion of Brexit negotiations were finalised during the pandemic. And it's total shock to the economy, make assessment of the deal very difficult. How much of an effect has Brexit made to current thinking of CFOs? So we, we've been asking CFOs um, this question since the referendum. And we've looked at their views on a number of different factors. So right after Brexit um, happened, we asked them, um, you know, what are the kinds of disruptions that they have seen? Um, and it wasn't, you know, kind of substantial. They had seen significant disruption over the first three months of this year. Um, and we also asked them, what level of disruption do they expect? 
in one year's time. And actually they expected a significant reduction um, in the levels of disruption that they had seen. So the sense immediately after Brexit was in terms of the short-term effects, um, you know, that they had, at least these big businesses had seen, you know, sort of some significant disruption and that they would end up easing over the, the year. Um, we did ask them what long-term, you know, what, what was the long-term impact on their plans on capital expenditure, on M&A, on hiring, and on all of those things, actually, for the period between the referendum up until Brexit, um, they, they actually reported, you know, reasonably negative effects on balance. Um, that fell very, very sharply after Brexit, perhaps because there was some clarity or at least the uncertainty up until the moment of Brexit in terms of what the relationship with the um, European Union would look like. I think that had gone. Um, and so there was a sharp fall in the kind of the negative impact that they expected in the long term on their own CapEx hiring and um, their own m and activity. Um, having said that, uh, I think what we are seeing now is a major, major economic shock, which is, I think, you know, going to completely transform um, the way businesses function. And it will be, I think, in about two or three years' time, quite difficult to disentangle the effects of Brexit from the effects of this pandemic. So it's unfortunately because of the timing, I think it will be very difficult to isolate um, the effects of these two um, shocks on the economy for both businesses and economists like me um, and point out um, to Brexit and say, well, you know, this is the kind of effect that it actually had. But in terms of business opinion, um, it looks as if, um, you know, the long-term impacts they were very negative in terms of um, the sense that they had, um, you know, with what Brexit could do um, to their own plans in the long term. That has reduced substantially. And in terms of the short term disruption, they expect it to ease um, in a year's time. OK, that's uh, that's good news. That's good news. And Kath, back to you. you. Um, what do you think the biggest challenges challenge is for businesses? and CFOs looking to become carbon neutral. You mentioned sustainability. What do you think the biggest challenge will be? In terms of short-term challenges, I think it's, it's interesting how some of this will play through from, from labour and supply shortages, because, you know, you, we know there's a, there's, there's a shortage of computer chips, for example, you know, which, which we, is at the root of so much technological investment. So there's, there's going to be an early short-term cost implication, um, a continued war for, for the talent and the technical skills. Um, because, you know, again, you know, what's interesting is we're talking about automation and so on. What that drives, of course, is it does away with some of the lower skilled jobs, but perhaps doesn't reduce your need for more highly skilled workers and indeed increases your need for more highly skilled workers. Because if you are investing in these technologies, you need workers who can implement it, use it, maintain it and program it and do all the other things that need to be done. So in, in the short term, you, I think you will see increased competition for a lot of different resources. Um, I think you do have to look longer term, though. And I think, you know, one of those challenges is understanding where the political economy is going in terms of what, what the government will seek to invest in. Um, so I was interested at one, one of the, the uh, other Thames Valley Chamber debates. We were talking about whether or not um, land based uh, wind power is going to be continue to be invested in in the future. So you know you're now into well, okay, what sources of sustainable power are going to be invested in in the future? Is it land-based wind? Is it offshore-based wind? Is it other, other other types of things? I hear today Rolls Royce have obtained significant investment to begin looking at generating small-scale nuclear reactors to to develop green energy. I mean, I know everybody says nuclear and green isn't the same. You know, isn't nuclear isn't green, but it, it is in terms of emissions. So a lot of this is going to come down to where the government wants to put its money. Some of that is coming in terms of investment in education. So we know the government is placing quite a lot of funding into um, higher and further education. Um, and one is to hope that a lot of that in turn will flow into STEM, particularly. So I think companies have to be very um, broad, 
brushed and forward thinking in terms of where they look for what they want to do. And that, that may mean that you're looking at, you know, investing in training in a different way, perhaps in terms of, you know, outreach into institutions that are particularly focusing what their, their, their educational offering on the kinds of individuals that you might want to employ. Um, and that's, that's to the good, you know, getting, you know, for business to look more closely at the communities they operate in and work out what best use of their input is to obtain the resources that they want. That, that's got to be a win-win. But I don't think anybody should be under any illusion that, that there's a quick fix for any of this. It, it, it's, it's a long game. Yeah, totally agree, Kat. Thanks very much for that. Um, we're coming to the end of the, the panel discussion shortly. Just a couple of questions. First to Jonathan, you talked about organisations recruiting a different type of experience level uh, and retention, but if you need to hire the knowledge, is there anything your clients are doing that has worked? Well, I think what complicates recruitment even further at the moment is the different way in which people look for jobs. So we have seen a reduction in response to adverts really over the past three to four years. And actually, our strategy is much more to go out to candidates these days to drop adverts into their inbox and in their phones, etc. When they're traveling to work, which is the time people look for a job the most, it's much more proactive. And I think... Um, people these days expect in all services really someone to knock on the door rather than particularly go out for applications so that's made it more complicated I think really also what they're looking for is very different social value is incredibly important to anyone looking at an organization uh, they don't expect companies to sort of negate any responsibility these days they want to know how that company is looking to help society as a whole they want to know you know what its green credentials are what its plans are um, and they want to know about culture they want to know the experience i mean culture and experience is still the highest over 70 percent candidates see that as the most important part and i think companies too often these days are still selling a job spec you know and a career and not selling the wider aspects of what that company does which holds holds more interest and i think the companies that are doing that are the ones who are winning at the moment great thank you jonathan that brings to an end our panel discussion um which i hope everybody found enthralling i certainly did so thanks to uh kath uh debo and jonathan um, for their insights and contributions, really thought provoking. And I hope um, everybody took um, something from, from the discussion. I suppose the two key uh, survey messages, just to remind everybody, were around recruitment difficulties and labor challenges and the outlook for operating costs uh, and margins, something that's significant to, to all businesses. I think you'd agree. A copy of the report um, and this video will be sent to um, all attendees by email. We can be available also, um, certainly Jonathan and I from, from Page Group, uh, and I'm sure uh, Kath and Debo also, uh, upon request to sort of talk through some of these challenges, uh, maybe a little further if it's, if it's um, being thought provoking to you. I just wanted to say uh, we are laser focused um, from a Page Group perspective, perspectives on how we can help provide solutions to your business challenges and provide data um, which allows for better labour decision making. It's what we do um, every single day. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to do a quick plug um, for, for Page Group. But we are we are a recruitment-led, labour-led organisation all day, every day. So we can provide um, that insight for you. Um, I'd love some ideas on the next event. We've, uh, we've done a couple of these events now um, with the Chamber of Commerce and we've had huge success with them. So I'm personally thinking that we could really look at how we manage the changing faces of the labour market. I think that's going to be absolutely critical as we become more digitalised. So I'll be, I'll be talking to Adrian and, and the crew around how we can maybe take that conversation a bit further. Um, but that's it for me. Um, I'll hand over to Adrian now. Thanks everybody for attending. Over to you, Adrian. Uh, Marcus and panellists, thank you very much indeed. And uh, just to reiterate what you've uh, been saying there, Marcus, in terms of uh, thought-provoking, uh, really fantastic insights. And of course, uh, a hugely credible conversation predicated on the substantive work that Delight have done over the last 14 years, as Debo just reminded us, in collating 
the data that informs their quarterly um, CFO survey. And that informs my next ask of you all, if I could. And that is, there is a parallel survey that's been going on somewhat longer, perhaps, and that is the British Chamber of Commerce, of which Thames Valley Chamber, of course, is the only accredited chamber in the Thames Valley region of the BCC, a network uh, in itself that is close on 130 uh, chambers spread globally, uh, 53 of which are located in the UK. A 300,000 member database is re uh, relied upon to inform the quarterly economic survey. And that survey is now live on the BCC website, but uh, my colleague Sarah is going to be uh, populating into the chat box a link and if you wouldn't mind please just three minutes of your time today uh, there are six uh, segments to the questionnaire and we would be entirely grateful if you could to take those three minutes and uh, inform us of or at least inform the chamber uh, of, of where the economy is at this moment in time uh, that is a more broad-based survey uh, but as I say, only three minutes, and that would be fantastic. Ultimately, there will be a presentation of the results on January the 11th. Uh, that is a national briefing, and on receipt of the completed form, you will receive an invite uh, to that event, and we would be delighted to see you then, January the 11th. That is a save the date. Before then, however, there are a number of events I would like to signpost you to. As you'll be familiar, even though we've had clearly challenges with uh, lockdown uh, and so on, as indeed all members have had, uh, we've been delighted with the support, including uh, the members who have joined this call here today, um, to be able to navigate this uh, last period. And of course, what that future looks like in terms of eventing, who knows? But certainly the direction of travel would suggest we're going back into something uh, of a hybrid nature. Um, and we've got a number of events to signpost you to over the course of the next couple of months as part of the ongoing program of work. Annually, uh, TV uh, deliver about 150 odd events. Um, majority pre-COVID, obviously, were face to face and uh, majority during COVID were in virtual environment. And again, thank you for your participation today in such strong numbers. But the first event would be November the 25th. It's led by my colleague, Sarah Paris. It's the beating heart of the Thames Valley. And uh, it's an interesting round table. Sarah is taking applications for those who would like to contribute. Uh, it's led, I am led to believe by uh, Sam Knowlton. Sam, if you're not uh, familiar with, is the principal of UTC Oxfordshire, uh, regularly features in the top 1% of independence in uh, the UK, uh, doing some great work there in delivering on some of the uh, conversation that we've been hearing earlier today, and she's doing it all day, every day. So what a terrific person to lead on that particular conversation. Sarah Paris, taking your details, or if you want to uh, submit to me and I will forward on your interest. We would be delighted if you could join. On December the 3rd, we have uh, another very interesting conversation. Uh, chamber member Microsoft, long-term chamber member, and Hugh Millward will join with Lord Ed Varsi in conversation as part of our political working lunch series. Uh, that is timed for 12 noon, December the 3rd. And it's all work, but not really, because there is actually an opportunity to play, and you are kindly invited to the Christmas luncheon that the Chamber will be resuming. It is on Thursday, December the 16th, and it is in the Majeski Stadium in Reading. We had a glorious day last time we did, which was about two years ago, and we are looking forward to reconnecting in a face-to-face -face environment, one of the few over the course of the last uh, year or so, as you'll appreciate, and we would be very much delighted if you could find time in your diary to join with us on that day. Full details of this event and all events are on www.thamesvalleychamber.co.uk. And so that really leads us to the close of this particular Business Alliance presentation. Uh, thank you very much indeed to the production crew, Sarah and her team, and indeed to the panelists, guest panelists and guest chair.
And also to you, of course, most importantly, for giving us the motivation, as Marcus has just said, to move forward and expand this conversation. We have been really uh, pleased with uh, Page Group and, uh, and Blake Morgan leaning in on previous conversations, delight similarly and delight of their own program, of course, as indeed do all members. But when we collaborate, we have really some great conversations, as we've just been hearing today, which hopefully you can take back to your respective organisations. As we draw to a close, it's for me to say probably a little bit early, but uh, we are getting ever closer to Christmas. I wish you all a safe and peaceful Christmas holiday season and wish you well for the rest of today and the week ahead. Thank you very much indeed. Take care.